Thank you. Um, so welcome. Thank you for joining us for session four. We have made it in the Gift of Life Empowering Living Kidney Donation Series. Uh, all lines have been muted today, and as you probably heard, today's session is going to be recorded, and a copy of these slides, the recording, and some accompanying handouts are going to be available on the Quality Insights website. There is going to be a time for questions at the conclusion of the presentation, um, so please put your questions in the Q&A box if you are able. Um, so if you look down at the bottom of your screen, it will say Q&A right next to chat. So we'll try and monitor both, but uh, Q&A if you are able. Our speaker today, as she has been for the last few sessions, is Glenna Frey. She is a nephrologist nurse and living kidney donor. She's the co-founder and executive director of Kidney Donor Conversations, which is a nonprofit organization that provides education and support for living kidney donation. This is the final webinar in a four-part series. The sessions have built on one another over time. You can always join in with us today if you haven't heard the others, but I think you'd really benefit from going back to view or review the previous presentations on our website. We are gonna walk through how to do this process later in our presentation, so hang on for that. Um, today's session, we'll dig into strategies for actually finding a living donor. All right, so today's presentation has been approved for continuing education credits for social workers. In order to claim these credits, you must, you must watch the webinar, complete the evaluation, and then a post-test questions, uh, and a link to the evaluation will be provided at the end of the presentation today. So, uh, during today's presentation, we will dig in to the limitations of transplant centers and organ procurement organizations, also called OPOs, on finding a living donor to improve communication with patients and families. We'll talk about and explore strategies for effectively communicating the need for a kidney donor to the public and discuss the American Society of Transplantation guidelines for public solicitation. Okay, so in planning this series, it has been the hope of the network that we can help to expand your default thought process um, for dialysis facilities and patients from one of, does someone have a friend or family member willing to donate and expand that out to living donation is an option even in the absence of those things. So to get us started, we're gonna take a poll that gauges your current comfort level with that topic. So you should see it on your screen. How comfortable are you with directing patients on how to find a living donor outside their immediate circle of family or friends? And I will turn it over to Glenna to uh, get us started as we wait for the results. So sessions one through three were designed to give you the background and foundational information for this fourth presentation. We've covered the kidney crisis, the transplant waiting list, the best treatment for chronic kidney failure, the process of living donation, and the benefits and barriers to donating. And now it's time to take all that we've learned and continue conversations with your patients. So let's look at the polling results, if they're in. So it looks like... What we've got 50, 60, about 70% of you are comfortable or somewhat comfortable um, with um, these discussions. And hopefully, again, we've got by the end of this session, hopefully that will also increase. So if you have a medical problem, where do you go for the best treatment for cancer? or a joint replacement, maybe a dental procedure, or kidney stones. Typically, physicians will directly provide you with treatment or they'll give you the orders to get the treatment. But uh, where do you go for a kidney transplant? Well, obviously you can get on the list for a deceased donor kidney, but if the best treatment 
for most patients as a living donor, who provides that treatment? The organ procurement organizations are government funded. Um, we have a complex system to seek and acquire deceased donor kidneys. Um, but guess what? There's no government funded system to seek and acquire living donor kidneys, which is the best treatment. So who else may be responsible? Um, is it the surgeon, the nephrologist, the transplant centers, the kidney registries, um, dialysis units? <laughs> the patient, the family, or other nonprofit organizations? Well, in most situations, the patients must find their own living donor. So this led me to ask the question, are there really enough healthy people to provide kidneys for everyone on the transplant waiting list? Well, I'm a visual learner, and so I wanted to see these numbers side by side. So let's look at the left column. These are all um, the US uh, Census Bureau adults. So we're looking at over 250 million people. And just take a look at this uh, graph because I'm gonna show you another graph that's gonna look a little different. So this is, we're looking at um, millions of people here. About over half of those six in 10 adults have a chronic disease. That's kind of interesting. Um, all about half also are registered organ donors. Uh, and I always wonder, once I looked at this, I'm like, well, I wonder how many of these registered organ donors have chronic disease, which I don't know that number. And so then I want to see, well, let's only talk about the healthy people. So according to this article, about 12% of the adults are metabolically healthy. So now we see this number drop pretty significantly. So this is just an interesting comparison of, of the registered organ donors. I really, I don't know how many have chronic disease, but let's say uh, a lot compared to this only 30,000 that are probably healthy. We don't know how many of these are actually registered organ donors though. So let's go on to this next graph. I want you to look at this 30 million, this is the same number, 30 million, um, just on a new graph. Because I want you to see the comparison of the number of people that are on the kidney transplant waiting list. This line doesn't even show up. This is not an error. This line is, is correct. It just doesn't show up because it's so small compared to the 30 million. And then of those, these are the 21,000 that received kidney transplants. So to answer the question, are there enough people? Uh, there probably are. There's a lot of healthy people um, that could potentially be donating uh, to people on the waiting list. And it really is a very, very tiny number that are getting kidney transplants. And remember, these are all transplants. These are not just living donors. So let's now look at the transplant numbers. So here we have uh, all the kidney transplants. You can see about 70% come from deceased donors and about 30% come from living donors. And there's about 6,000 living kidney donors a year. And these numbers have stayed the same. This is 2018 data, but it really hasn't changed much uh, over the years at all. And this is now just all the kidney transplants um, that are living. So this is this orange section here is this entire graph. And you can see that the terminology is a little different. They call it not anonymous. That means you know who you're donating to. And about 95% of the people are, you know, know their know who they're donating to, their, you know, family, friends, relatives. And then anonymous, which we call non-directed, that's about the other 5%, so a very small, tiny sliver. Um, so there seems to be a lot of potential opportunities for people to receive a living kidney, a living kidney. Um, but what if you don't have a donor? What if you're part of this you know, tiny percent that is looking for maybe a stranger to donate to you? 
So for those people, uh, sometimes they'll go to social media, um, highways <laughs> to find living donors. So I wanted to know, is it okay to solicit people for their kidneys? Should we encourage them to go out and look for donors in the public and on social media? I mean, we know they do it, but like, is it okay, you know, as a healthcare professional, is it okay to encourage them to or help them to? So I found this article um, from organizations that focus on transplantation and they gathered in 2006 and developed these nice guidelines for us. There were representatives from UNOS, the American Society of Transplantation, American Society of Transplant Surgeons, and the North American Transplant Community. So what they did is they got together, they have these guidelines called um, Guidelines for the Psychosocial Evaluation of Living Unrelated, so it's specifically for those non-directed donors in the United States. And really, I think the most important piece um, from this article is this statement. The ways in which relationships are developed in society with respect to living donation cannot be regulated or restricted. So basically they're saying, yes, it's okay to go seek a living donor. We know that all potential donors go through in-depth testing to be accepted, and it is the most regulated surgery that we have. No one gets through without very extensive evaluation process, regardless of the transplant center. So if there's no problem helping to find living donors, where do we even start um, with potentially helping patients? So in session two, if you remember, we discussed the importance of telling stories about the need for a kidney. This happens before the idea is sparked for a donor, donor, which is step one. So before that, there has to be typically a story a potential donor must hear about the need for a kidney. These stories then are the precursor to start the living donor stages to progress. So telling stories is critical to helping the discovery of kidney donors. So let's explore some concrete ways to move forward with telling these stories. Part of the process of telling stories is to first inform people that a kidney can be donated while alive. I'm always amazed at the number of people that I talk to that aren't even, even aware that you can donate while you're alive. They just think, you know, you're registered to be an organ donor and you die and that's how I'm donating. They don't even know there's a concept or an idea of donating while alive. I think for some of us in the kidney space, we kind of get used to, you know, knowing, you know, it's familiar to us. But when you think about lay people, you have to understand that they really don't know all the information that we know about uh, transplant and dialysis. So I like to think of living donor awareness in terms of three C's that are maybe a little easy to, to remember, um, coach, circle, and car. And so let's start with coach. Patients in CKD stage four or five are typically not feeling really well. They often have low energy, maybe pain, they're not working, they're just trying to get through day to day. To me, it seems really disrespectful and insensitive to also ask them to go find their own best treatment, a living kidney donor. It may be helpful to find someone to advocate on their behalf, like a personal coach to support through this process, to help share their story of needing a transplant, to help them live longer. And it's okay to have others assist you, even if they're not a family member. So just think of how people could talk about your story, maybe to groups, um, create a Facebook page or talk about it on Facebook. Um, I'll give you an example. My um, niece, um, whose mother needed a transplant, she did just a real personal story about why she felt her mother um, should get a living donor kidney. 
And she made that post and one of her friends, not a real, real close friend, but a friend of hers stepped forward and ended up donating. So it didn't even have to be a big major thing. It was just this personal post and story that she shared. But it could be information through newsletters, other social media avenues. You know, we have so many opportunities now with the computer, um, the internet, um, that we didn't have even 10 years ago. So there's, it would just be really helpful if someone who's very computer savvy, outgoing, that could help be the coach for a patient. Next is circle. Most of us know many people in our communities and that's our circle of influence. Examples include friends, neighbors, maybe faith-based organizations, hobby groups, exercise groups, hairdressers, barbers, classmates, whoever we interact with, we can share our stories with. And spreading stories of dialysis and the benefits of a living donor transplant. And again, I just want to really emphasize people do not know what it's like to have dialysis three times a week, every week of their life. Um, they really need to help. Uh, you really need to help kind of paint that picture of what life on dialysis is like and how it can change with a living transplant. So spreading stories. And as you're talking, you never know who the one person might be who may want to donate. And you know what? You can't tell who they are just by looking at them. So the last C is car. Coach and Circle included people to help tell the story or share the stories. And a car now represents signs that may reach potential donors. These signs could be on a car, billboards. Now I know billboards can be really expensive, but sometimes you can get them donated. Uh, maybe posters or these cards that are like a business card with the QR code. Those are really popular right now. You could have a QR code linked um, to a website. T-shirts. Um, don't underestimate the value of a t-shirt. Um, and usually on the back or in this case, on the front, it's like, will you be a kidney donor? Um, I read a story about someone who had t-shirts in Disney and found their living donor there that someone came forward just because they saw them wearing that t-shirt. I do have two rules about signs. Uh, number one is I don't like to see the blood type listed. Um, we have paired exchanges. And I think, for example, if someone's looking for a blood type O and I'm an a, I may think, oh, that's not me. So you might self-exclude when you're not that same blood type that they're looking for. Um, I do like the sign here that says, um, Larry needs a kidney, pretty simple. Any blood type, I like that word. And then phone number of the dialysis transplant, or I'm sorry, the transplant center, not dialysis, the transplant center. So those are my two rules, no blood type, and the phone number of the transplant center, not the patient's phone number. So I'm wondering what guidelines are out there about actually telling the story. Well, there's a lot of nonprofits that can help in this area. And so let me share some with you. First, National Kidney Foundation has a program called the Big Ask, Big Give. It's in-person or online presentations that can help someone or family members looking for a living donor. They provide education, information, and tools. You can check the NKF website for more information about that program. Risa Simon is an educator and transplant recipient. She has a website called Transplant Strong that provides free videos and a phone app called Donor Seeker. The videos are on her website and they're also within this mobile app. There are just four lessons and they're actually all together, they're less than 15 minutes. So it's a very simple, easy to understand information. Um, and so the phone app also has other resources um, available. 
One of those things is a contact list worksheet. So if you had, say, a coach or someone designated to help you tell the story, you could use this worksheet and get a list of people that you know and just indicate whether they're willing to share the story or they might consider testing, but kind of gives you an organizational plan to work with um, if you have, again, someone helping. This would be a really good resource. Um, just a word about telling the story. I just want to mention that it's important to get consent from the potential recipient um, that it's okay to share their story before someone goes out to start sharing the story. So just make sure they're okay with that. Another resource she has is a book. It's it's very small, thin book. It's very easy. It's called In Pursuit of a Better Life, The Ultimate Guide for Finding Living Kidney Donors. And I just wanted to show you an indication of the index and the kind of topics they cover. So she has this sample letter and post section. Um, so you can see, you know, newsletter ideas, uh, social media posts, social media planner, uh, scripting the story, story post. So a nice kind of guide for helping to uh, get all of those little pieces together. Sometimes instead of talking about finding a living kidney donor, I like to mimic Harvey myself and say, have your donor find you. His organization is Living Kidney Donors Network, or LKDN. His free video program is called Having Your Donor Find You. And um, by, telling donor, by telling stories, they feel like donors will come forward. You don't even have to ask them. They will just say, yes, this is something I wanna do and move through the process. There are 11 short videos and you can see some of the topics, but this one is telling your story in person, telling your story using email, social media, getting creative. So again, some really nice, concrete, uh, detailed information about, about storytelling. The National Kidney Registry, we've talked about them a lot in these series. Um, they have free microsites or websites. So I'll be honest with you, I don't know why they call them microsites, but a microsite is a website if you hear that word. Um, but it's only free if you go through certain transplant centers. And so you can go to this website, findakidney.org, and locate which transplant centers offer these free websites for looking for a donor. And I Oh, Elizabeth, I think I need to pause to see if you have something you wanted to share before I go on. Yes, I just dropped a couple of comments um, in the chat, in the chat, excuse me, to say um, we're going to have an accompanying handout that will make it very clear um, which transplant centers within Network 3, 4, and 5 participate and where you can find the microsites. Um, and we will also have a link to that contact list worksheet. So stay tuned um, to get access to that. Great, thanks. So I wanted to say, see what these microsites looked like. So this is uh, this was a screenshot I took in December. It was currently active microsites, and you can see people's um, pictures, and there's more. This is not all of them. There's many more. So I just chose one, um, Manu Harris. I don't know any of these people, so um, I'm not advocating anything other than here they are. And then this is what the site looks like. Um, the, one of the most important things, I think, is right here on the right, there's a dark blue box that you can click if you're interested in donating, and then it'll take you right to the NKR health questionnaire. Um, I thought, you know what, this could general format could be a model for anyone wanting to have a website started or created to look for a kidney donor. Um, some people like to use videos and it's a little more personal, can tell your story. Um, and so that's something that sometimes can be added to websites. They don't use 
uh, the videos on this website specifically. But another uh, person who has uh, websites does use videos more. Uh, David Chrisman likes to create videos. That's kind of his forte to help look for donors. So he also has a podcast called The Great Social Experiment, and it's got many episodes about the kidney crisis in the United States. Um, in addition, he offers free microsites and t-shirts that can be printed with QR codes that take you back to that website. And again, he uses, uh, he likes to use video for the stories. Chris Smeltz is an RN and a kidney donor, and he started the nonprofit Kidney Search Foundation. So his search package is what he calls it, is a profile page on that website, the Kidney Search Foundation website. So in the page, um, you can talk about your need for a living donor and there's that client profile. In addition to that page, he will create two out of these three items, either car window decals or personalized t-shirts or search cards, which were those little business cards. And again, all of these items are free. So next I wanna discuss some organizations that focus on special groups of people that can help. Renewal is based out of New York City and originated as a Jewish faith-based organization. They help patients and families navigate kidney transplant from finding a donor to arranging for transplant and beyond. This is another screenshot of their website. And you can see there are a national organization. They have outreach, genetic matching, support, medical referrals, and dialysis education I thought was interesting. Dove was started by a social worker and a living donor, Sharon Kreitzer, and it's based on the renewal model. Um, Dove supports any eligible veteran who is actively listed for a kidney transplant. So someone has to already be registered as, uh, you know, to, on the deceased donor list. And they help to create an outreach campaign within their networks and community. And this again is another screenshot from their website. They have information for kidney donors and they do a lot of support for kidney donors information for vet transplant candidates and resources and links. Kidneys for Communities focuses on community organizations. For example, maybe the Masonic organization or first responders or maybe faith-based groups. So they're helping those in search of a kidney reach into their community organizations and ask for help. This is on their website. So if you're an organization leader, you can go in to help your members. If you want to donate a kidney and are part of an organization, you can click here. And if you're looking for a kidney, you can click here. So the whole concept is that people may be more willing to donate a kidney to someone within an organization where they already belong. Kidney donor conversations. Um, we have two one-page handouts. These are front and back. And this one is was designed for the recipient. So that would be your dialysis patient. Um, I find a lot of patients just don't even understand the benefits of a living donor kidney. Uh, they seem to think a kidney is a kidney is a kidney, and they're pretty happy being on a transplant waiting list and waiting for a deceased donor. So we developed this. It gives just a little view, overview of the problem, why transplant's better than dialysis, why a living kidney is best, the types, ways to get kidney donors, the risk for a donor. I find they also really don't understand anything about living kidney donation. 
I mean, I mean, why would they know that, that they're the ones sick, not the one going to donate? So this just talks a little bit about the risk and then a few resources um, for finding how to find a living donor. Glenda, I just wanted to hop in here and point out that I dropped two links into the chat so that folks can go directly to these resources. That might be a good step one after this presentation is just to print them out and have them for patients um, to help kind of expand their own knowledge. Uh, I also just thought it was interesting and you may not have seen, um, sounds like we have somebody in the chat um, who has some experience with using some of these resources, um, particularly, I guess, the the microsite through the great social experiment. Um, so I thought that's a great uh, backing for some of the things that you're saying. Uh, it looks like there is a current and active microsite going. So pointing wow. that out and certainly um, check mm -hmm. out the links in the chat. Nice, that's good to hear that, you know, you're already using some of these resources. So that's super. Um, so again, this was the recipient handout. And then next, it looks very similar. So don't get them confused. Um, this is the donor handout. So why become a living donor? A lot of the information is not different because think about it. Often uh, living donors, potential living donors don't know anything about kidney disease because, you know, they're probably healthy people, unless it's a, a you know, close family member. Um, they may not understand the problem or know that transplant's better than dialysis. They may think treatment is treatment. Aren't you happy? You get this, you know, dialysis treatment to keep you alive. Well, they may not really understand how important a transplant is. And a living kidney is better. The risk for donors, the ways to donate and then kind of how to get started. So this can also be given to, to your patients because they can then hand these out to people to help them understand and have the resources to get started um, or you know, give them to the coach that might be helping them uh, along the way to hand these out. Um, again, it can go back to community organizations and having these handouts available. If you know someone that reads, and I say that because I keep running into people who say they don't read when I want to give them or offer these books, um, this is a pretty simple book. It's less than 200 pages. It was written by Ari Sittner. He is a social worker and a rabbi, and it was about his experience with donating. Um, it's the kidney donor's journey, 100 questions I asked before donating my kidney, and it's organized as pre-transplant, then the surgical experience, and then afterward. So it's a really nice resource. I encourage both people who are curious about donating to read it. I also encourage family members or people who need a kidney to read it to help understand that process better. Again, we have two types of people, very sick on dialysis with chronic disease who doesn't understand donation, and the donation people who may not understand the, the dialysis piece. So um, use these resources to the appropriate audience um, as we go through these. And just a reminder that these four sessions we've been doing, the gift of life, empowering kidney, living kidney donation, they're recorded sessions. I know you've already heard that, but they can also be used for other staff. You know, I think a lot of you attending our social workers, but there's no reason why these couldn't be encouraged and shared and viewed uh, by anyone in a dialysis unit, Any anyone who works with people um, that are looking or talking about dialysis or kidney transplant. And I believe Elizabeth is gonna talk a little more about the Network 5 website. Yeah, piggybacking off what Glenna was saying about the fact that all of these sessions have been recorded. Um, so they can be referenced back if you need to just review, if you'd like other people on your team to watch them. Uh, the good part about a recording is you can kind of cut it down to the place that you found to be most helpful. 
Um, and so we wanted to make sure it was really clear how to navigate to that. This is the link for the network, the Quality Insights Network 5 website. And you can see that first arrow there. You'll click on the About tab, and then you will click on Webinars. I think we can move to the next one. And this, uh, this is how it looks at the current moment. So you'll see under January 10th, it says coming soon. Uh, we should have that up hopefully by the end of the week. That will be today's recording and the slide deck. Uh, and we hope to also have a handout. I've mentioned that a couple of times, but based off of some feedback we got in our previous session, I thought we probably were going to get a request for a condensed version where all of these resources we've been talking about are listed with a very brief explanation of what they are and how to get to them. So we're gonna have that for the things we spoke about today uh, and that'll be listed right under January 10th. Um, under January 6th, we, um, we're still hammering it out. It looks like something's there now, but we will also have the, um, the resources we spoke about in session three which are um, assistance programs available to people who are looking into being a living donor. Uh, and we've had some other handouts there. So this just gives you a clear picture of how to get there and where to look so that you can refer back. All right, and then we're gonna come back to our original polling question just to gauge how and hopefully if your comfort level has changed about this topic. So you should um, soon, there we go. See the question, how comfortable are you with directing patients on how to find a living donor outside of their immediate circle of family and friends? Comfortable, somewhat comfortable, not at all comfortable. So hopefully you've been thinking about your patients and how these resources might be helpful for them and their families. I can't emphasize enough the importance of getting their story out to as many people as possible. And you never know who might step forward and be willing to donate. So let's see if we have our polling results. Oh, nice. Only 2% of you now say you're not comfortable. So I'm like so excited that you feel like, I am I hope that means that some of these tools you think you'll be able to use and feel a little more confident as you're having conversations with patients. That's great. So now what? How does the team, your team, need to move forward to support patients? What support do you need? What's the first next step? Thinking back before you participated in this series, how has your ability to discuss living donation changed? Here are some questions to ask patients to find out their understanding of resources to find a kidney donor. Ask them what they've been told about living kidney donation and how to tell their story. Uh, people who may be able to find living donors, do they know the ways to discover them? And do they know of any organizations that may be able to help? It sounds like based on some of um, the feedback that, that they're using some of these resources, so that's great to hear, but I'll, I'll, I'll could probably bet that most of your patients do not know um, or have access to a lot of these resources. Let me clarify that. They have access to them, they may not know about them. So I wanted to just um, kind of review some sessions from, from our very first session one. And when are you planning to start the transplant discussion in dialysis. Um, and again, this is just a review, um, but I wanted to kind of bring back full circle um, after you've heard of some of the information, now to think about where you could start inserting some of these discussions. Remember, a lot of this is gonna be based on some of the goals, how the patient's feeling, et cetera. Transplant, hopefully, 
is not a once a year discussion by one person. So how often are you going to discuss transplant? And is this only the responsibility of the social worker? How do you go back and get your whole team involved with some of the conversations? And I wanted to hop in here too. Um, something that I was thinking about when you were going over the various website and microsite options earlier is just that this is a real opportunity to um, give a, a, a direct job to maybe somebody else in the facility. Um, and that can help to kind of loop them into making a, a culture of transplant in the facility. So I think we all know it's pretty common knowledge that certain staff members click better with certain patients. And so is there a piece of this that maybe that person could help with? Um, is, is one of the technicians really technology savvy and they could point out how to navigate to one of these sites in order to use it? Um, does somebody connect with the patient and maybe could help them jot down and dictate a story or help them um, to brainstorm ideas for what is their story. Um, you know, social work, I, I would think, would be a little more skilled with searching through some of those emotions of why me, why do I deserve one, um, any of those things. So I see a lot of um, opportunities to loop in a lot of different parts of the team tier two. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. As you were talking, I was just triggered with, and I don't know, do the dialysis units have access to a tablet so that you can, you know, I mean, everyone's got like their cell phones, right? I know what I do with um, patients that I work with is I'll bring my phone over and if there's an app I want them to find, I'll show them what it looks like and kind of walk through it so they're familiar with it and they kind of have a visual understanding of it rather than just saying, you know, go find this and it'll help you. So I think that's a really great idea to, you know, sit with them and guide them through as much as possible these pieces that you think are going to be appropriate. Um, so really, what is your plan for education? Um, and discussing the, the referral for transplant. I think, um, you know, I kind of advocated that everyone should be referred for transplant within the first couple months. Um, but some of that depends on how much education you've provided, the how the patient's feeling. Um, but just think about who's going to be appropriate and, and how you're going to reevaluate them and refer them back to the team. I think if they say they're not a good candidate or they're on hold, what will help make them, you know, be active again on the, like, on the waiting list or a good candidate when maybe they're not a good candidate now? And then what are your education ideas, again, based on um, the information you've received um, and the resources that we have now? Um, just another point I wanna make is um, you kind of have two audiences to think about. You've got the very sick dialysis patient and then you've got hopefully their family or friends. And so the learning me needs may be different depending on uh, which person you're kind of addressing at the time. Um, and I think sometimes Elizabeth kind of alluded to the patient may not, they may automatically say, no, I don't I have a donor. I don't want a transplant, but I want you to be really sure that they're well educated about it and then that you ask the question again after you've provided more education. Um, they might be more open to the idea after learning facts about donor risk, surgery, recovery, and they may just need a support person to help them tell their story. So I put this together as just a visual of based on your patient's family, values, support, they may how they prefer to learn. This may help you match them 
or remember their family with an appropriate resource. So you can use one or more that are identified as the best fit. For example, you might be dealing with a patient um, who, well, the patient may not want to do an educational webinar. They may not want to read a book, but maybe the family does. Um, everyone might be willing to put on a t-shirt and go to Cedar Point or the family members might, or a car decal. So I think there's a lot of opportunities and it doesn't have to be just one thing. Um, I know one of the things I wanted to do is give you a variety of resources rather than just tell you this is what the story should look like and how you should say it. I think it depends on the person and the need at the time for which resource you might use at what particular point in time also. And back to Elizabeth for our next polling question. Yes, so we're gonna round out the polling questions today um, and have you uh, think about the impact that this session as well as the other four, uh, um, hoping that you have seen those have kind of affected how you practice. So after attending this web series, how likely are you to change your approach to living donor transplant education with patients? Not at all likely, likely already made changes. So we've given you a lot of information to think about. Um, please just start with one or two, two resources with maybe one or two patients. See what works and what doesn't. Share successes with your team and make modifications as needed. Wow, does that sound like a quality improvement plan or what? So, but really this is not a cookie cutter uh, plan. This is try it, maybe something doesn't resonate with them. And so you wanna try something else. Um, so don't feel like it has to be this very specific thing, but work with your patients and, and really collaborate with them together to develop this plan and using the resources. Did the polling answers come up yet? Did I miss them? Yep, okay. Yep. I would just like to say we're back to that little tiny 2% that are maybe not likely to use the resources. And it could be a variety of reasons. It could be depending on where they work also. Um, so really encouraging to see that 90% are likely and some 10% have already made changes. So that's, that's really uh, incredible. Thank you. So um, it has been a huge honor and privilege to be able to provide these four presentations with Network 5 and Quality Insights. A huge thanks goes to Elizabeth Nushki, Randy Vinson, and Lori Fink for all your support in making these happen. You may reach out to me if you have any questions, concerns um, at glana at mykdc dot org and back to Elizabeth. I did say that we were going to round out the polling questions and that was partially true. Um, but before we get to questions about today's sessions or other things living kidney donor related, um, we wanted to we are moving at the network level our own thoughts over to what do we do now? And so we wanted to get some feedback from you all uh, about what are the barriers to providing education about living kidney donor transplants to your patients and their families. Uh, so we are asking that you place your answers in the chat. And um, at the end, we are going to, um, after this session, we will randomly select five winners for a prize and you will be contacted via email to receive the prize. Um, just a note, um, when you put this in the chat, if you notice that your answer is the same as somebody else's, go ahead and put it in there. That way we know this really is an area that's a, a pretty big struggle. Um, but so we're hoping that we'll get, we're hoping that we'll get some traction and help us to know which 
direction to go in next as a network. So we'll give you guys some time to enter those things in. Um, we're happy to have folks from several different networks so we can kind of get a broader perspective of how things are going. I can see some answers rolling in, which is excellent, and we really appreciate that. Right, so we will still um, be giving time for you guys to put some of those answers in the chat. But um, as you are doing that, I wanted to switch over to taking, also taking some questions about today's presentations or others, just to help me separate out what might be a question and what is an answer to um, to the barriers, if you could put questions about today's session in the Q&A box. So that is right next to the chat down there at the bottom. Um, we did want to start out the question session with, uh, with answering one that came in in the registration process. And that question had to do with the effect of donating a, of a living donor on their adrenal glands. And I know, Glenna, you had prepared something for us to kind of walk through that process. Yeah, so first I wanna give you a little bit of background on um, the surgery of uh, removal for a donor. So a left nephrectomy is preferred because you can see here in this diagram, there's a longer renal vein. So they take as much of that vein as they can when they remove the kidney. Um, sometimes though, they'll take the right kidney for a variety of reasons. It could be the vascular structure. Um, it could be the, that um, the right kidney is healthier. Uh, something I didn't know till I donated is that they will always leave the healthiest kidney for the donor. So what would be an example, maybe there's one stone in one of the kidneys that is not gonna cause a problem, but they would then give that to the recipient rather than keep it um, for the donor, if that makes sense. So my point is they could be taking the right kidney or they could be taking the left kidney. So the interesting thing about the adrenal gland is on the left kidney, the adrenal gland empties into the left kidney vein. For the right kidney adrenal gland, it empties into the vena cava. So when they take the right kidney, they do not take the adrenal gland with them. But when they take the left kidney, they do. So there have been reports of donors that have had a lot of fatigue after kidney donation. So there was a group that did a study of 30 living donors. So remember, this is a very tiny study, only 30 donors. And basically what they found was the left-sided living kidney donation has a reduced adrenal cortical responsiveness, they actually measured cortisol. So it had a, a lower cortisol level, but it returned to baseline after 28 days. So that was very interesting um, because I have donors that say they've had fatigue for years and years after uh, donating. And I'm guessing that's where this question came from because they've heard, they've heard of that. Or, you know, I think we actually had a donor on some of the other presentations. So I don't know if you're you're on this one or not. So basically, one of the things that's also important to know, we do not measure adrenal function as part of the workup. So we don't know if all of these adrenal glands are functioning normally before or afterwards. So it's kind of um, probably an uncharted area for for the science of exactly what we know related to a right or left nephrectomy and the fatigue. But at least in this study, um, after a month, they say, nope, cortisol levels went back to normal. Thank you for that. Um, 
looking through some of the questions that have come in, one was, is renewal still Jewish specific for living donor searches? So you do not have to be of Jewish faith to participate in renewal. Um, it's pretty well known in the Jewish community and renewal has, has been, I think, extremely successful with helping to support uh, donors and recipients um, as an organization. So no, you do not have to be Jewish faith though. Um, something I noticed when I was looking at the website too is do you have to be local to the New York area? N no, they do have a national presence. So they will go, you know, you, they can support people across the, the country. It's fine. Do not have to be a uh, resident of New York. The next question is, do you have any recommendations, resources that speak about living donors outcomes or risks to the donor? I find some of my patients are hesitant to reach out to family or networks because they worry about their quality of life post donation. I feel like part of, part of this you talked about last time, but um, could you give us a your best answer to that one at this point? <laughs> so the so in the handouts that I gave you, um, it talks about some of the major risk, uh, but um, if I understand the question correctly, you know, what I think of, you know, if I had to talk, you know, for a minute on the risk of for donors is the risk of surgery is the same as childbirth and actually less than gallbladder. The long-term risk of getting kidney failure is very small. Uh, and according to some studies, in fact, I'm going to throw up another slide for you to see. Um, this was a study that looked at the, the GFR and albuminuria. They looked at eight years of over 600, you know, around um, almost 600 donors. And 8% of them developed a low GFR with albuminuria. Um, and that was over three years. And they found that the risk was a little higher if they had pre-donation hypertension or post-donation diabetes. Um, but again, what I want to point out is this did not, it, this was over eight years, but it did not indicate that they would go into kidney failure either. So there are those risk calculators that I've mentioned in previous sessions where you can calculate as good as we have the data for your, your risk based on your own personal statistics and, and numbers. And that's what I think I, I encourage people to do is not just say, oh, it's a high risk surgery. Well, it's a high risk for who, you know, you need to look at the donor and their risk factors um, and issues, not just say, you know, oh, it's safe or it's not safe. Mm -hmm. If you're not, you can need to look at the individual. Um, the other thing is for future pregnancies. I just want to point out that there is a higher risk of preeclampsia, which is high blood pressure. If you're pregnant after you've donated, there has not been any studies to indicate this is a problem for the childbirth or the child. It just means that they're watched more closely during that pregnancy. Um, again, and there's no contraindication to getting pregnant after you've donated. Um, are there other potential complications? It's like any other surgery, um, you know, the other risks are pretty much the same. I've already addressed the fatigue issue, um, but those are the biggies. Just like any other disease, you're going to have outliers of people who have absolutely no problems and other people who have had many problems. But basically, a far, far majority of the donors who have donated say they would do it again. Um, Sounds like looking back through um, some of our previous slides, um, for the previous session, yes. that's a good idea. I know you mentioned um, some transplant centers as well are working 
on um, or, or working with an organization to get more long-term research on the outcomes for living donation. Um, so that might be something to follow. Um, in the interest of time, I want to do one more question that we've seen oh, sure. through. I would like to know if you had kidney, do, uh, had kidney donation letter samples to provide to our patients. Uh, I, I'm not sure if this means like a sample of a of a need, um, in which case, if it's a sample letter or, or write up of somebody's story about their need for a donation, I think some of the things you mentioned earlier in the presentation, some of those microsites where you can view them might be a good place to start. Um, yes, to I, agree. I agree. I think the resources, rather than scripting that for you, I wanted to let you go to the resources and see what's appropriate for your patient and the circumstances. Okay, we did get clarification if the patient wants to write a letter out to the community. Um, so I think that's what they're looking for. National Kidney Foundation, I think has a sample letter. Um, I think uh, Risa Simon. Okay. And Harvey Mysell, I think their little short, um, videos would be a good place to start. Great. Well, thank you. Um, so the slide that we have up now, this is my contact information. If we didn't get to your question or anything else comes up, please feel free to give me a call or an email. If you are tuning into us from networks three or four, I am happy to answer your question. I can also help to direct you to the quality improvement specialist in your area. So I can be a point person for you. Uh, and then our last slide there, this will give you, um, we can drop in the chat as well, the link to the evaluation. Remember, this is a part that's needed. Yes, so it's in the chat now. Um, filling out the evaluation and the post-test questions are what's required to get the continuing education. We will, um, by the end of this week, have a wrap-up email that'll have this in there as well. Um, and just thank you again for joining us. Thank you for the engagement in the chat and the question and answer session. We, um, if you have any further questions going forward, we are always available. So thank you guys so much.